Welcome to the Augsburg panel with your host, Jake Zabel. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Augsburg panel, the monthly Q&A theological podcast where I get a panel of three Lutheran theologians to answer listener questions. This is our first one for 2020. And this month I decided I wanted to do something different. And so rather than having pastors on, I'm going to have uh, laymen on. I have had laymen on in the past with guys like Gene Veith, but there's going to be a panel of just laymen. And specifically, I wanted to get um, laymen podcasters on. Um, so I've got three laymen podcasters on. We were going to have uh, Eric Peterson, the Outback Berean, who's an Australian podcaster, but something came up with him, and so he's had to drop out and won't be joining us. But our next panellist for this panel is uh, Matthew Garnett, who does the podcast in layman's term. Matthew, you'd like to introduce yourself and tell people a little about your show and what you do. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Yeah, Matthew Garnett. um, I'm a... uh, long haul truck driver by day and podcaster by night and we try to address pretty much everything that's going on in um american christianity uh that landscape uh you know cutting edge stuff also um a- am privileged to be able to write for uh publications like the federalist i've also published in the lutheran witness um and we just uh try to analyze what's you know what you know what's going on here what's what's american christianity doing where's it going where's it where's it evolving what what are the pitfalls what are the benefits um and and that sort of thing and you know try try to help people try to direct people especially western christians i i you know that's one thing that i'm very concerned about at this at this time is that western christianity is breaking down and so we we try to steer uh, Christians that are uh, baptized Christians to the places where they can get uh, resources and and support for uh, continuing in their faith. We 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 that that's the idea. Um, you know, I, I I'm a father of two, and my goal for that for my two children is that they keep their faith. And that's kind of what I do with my podcast is if you're a Christian in the Western world, especially in the United States, I just want you to keep your faith. And, and, and that's the idea. And then probably above all that is just helping me think through the issues uh, of Western Christianity. Um, so my podcast helps, uh, especially, especially helps me to stay engaged and, and, and on, and what I'm hoping is That'll help uh, other Western Christians stay engaged and keep their faith as well. Cool. So, as I mentioned, you're not a pastor. Do you have any kind of theological training or stuff like that? Yeah, I do. I was I was uh, a pastor in an evangelical mega church back in the day, and um, I studied at um, uh, Dallas Theological Seminary and Biblical Theological Seminary, which is which is an offshoot of Westminster. <laughs> Theological Seminary, so I, I do have some, some training in that area, but um, as far as, as Christianity is concerned, especially Lutheran Christianity, I am definitely a layman, and uh, that's that's really what I want in, in a lot of ways uh, for others to, to get from me is, hey, educate yourself, study your Bible, uh, be up on the issues of the day, know, know what's going on. Um, you know, it, 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 it can be done. And so, um, you know, even though, I, even though I've got some training, uh, I, 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 I have come, you know, the, even, yeah, the, the a well catechized Lutheran has the goods on me, even though I was trained at Dallas seminary and a branch of Westminster seminary, um, laymen should know what they're talking about. They should know what they're talking about. So, um, you know, that's that's kind of where I'm coming from, and that's that's what that's kind of what my hope is uh, with 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 what I do in, in, on the In Layman's Term podcast and, and in my publications. Apart from just googling In Layman's Term, how would people find your content? 
you can uh, go to the website laymanstermsradio.org. That's where you're going to find all of our podcast content. You can also find our publications on, um, if, if you just Google Matthew Garnett Federalist, uh, that'll bring up my page on the Federalist. And then um, on our website, laymanstermsradio.org, you're going to see all of my uh, media appearance, I mean, all of my media appearances and, um, and articles for the Lutheran Witness and whatnot are all on there. Our next panelist for the podcast is Caleb Keith of The Thinking Fellows. Caleb, would you like to tell the listeners about yourself and your podcast and what you do? Uh, yeah, my name is Caleb Keith. I'm the executive director of podcasting for 1517, which has uh, 1517.org, which has about 14 podcasts now and, uh, and counting. Uh, the Thinking Fellows is the premier co- podcast on our podcast network been hosting it for about four years with my co-hosts, Drs. Rod Rosenblatt, Scott Keith, and Adam Francisco, and we have rotating guests in there as well. Uh, the podcast is meant to do uh, doctrinal theology, history of Christianity, and Christian apologetics. And we've been doing that, um, like I said, for f- four years with rotating topics. We started with uh, following Melanchthon's Loci Communis, and we, we covered the basic doctrinal topics in there. The episodes are 40 minutes long, and they're designed to be uh, conversations for lay people to follow and learn. They're meant to be a catechetical tool, which highlights uh, Christ and Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins, and how that uh, all falls from that and and is involved in that. And so, yeah, it's it's a fun show. We've been um, you know blessed with a, a good audience who interacts with us. Lately, we do a lot of listener questions and engagement. And things like that. Um, and this January, we're actually starting a new series on apologetics. It's been a while since we've done consecutive ec- episodes on apologetics. So we've been accepting apologetic questions from listeners and people on the internet in order to uh, to do that again for like another eight weeks. So uh, yeah, and you can find the podcast at 1517.org or wherever else podcasts are found. And like I said, um, you know, the title of the Thinking Fellows is not because it's a bunch of smart guys talking, but it's reflective of 1517 has what's called a thinking fellowship of authors and writers and, and now podcasters, speakers, and things like that. And the show was originally and, and still intended to um, highlight things going on in that thinking fellowship, conversations going on there, doctrinal issues at hand, um, and bring those down to be, you know, conversations that people can can cling to and, and learn from. It's not about a bunch of people with PhDs sort of uh, rambling with each other. We really do aim it to be a, a catechetical t- tool um, so that people can be excited about learning theology and be encouraged to do things. And you know, one of the really common things in our show is to recommend uh, further reading for listeners to show that this isn't just stuff that we're making up. Um, you can go find this and this is where we learned it and sort of give people that library if, if that's something they're looking for. As you said, your show is not a bunch of guys with PhDs sitting around, and you're a layman as well. Do you have any kind of theological training under your belt? Uh, yeah, I've been. My my dad has a PhD in uh, theology, and he's been studying theology my whole life. So, sort of absorbed some of that from him growing up. Um, and then I I did go to Concordia University in Irvine, where I received a bachelor's in theology and classical language. And then I'm currently pursuing an MA in systematic theology from the University of Nottingham in England. Um, I'm nearly completed with that. I'm in the what they call the dissertation phase, so I have no more classes. It's just uh, writing, and that'll be, I'll be done with that fairly soon. And then um, from there, I, I might take a break or I might go into a PhD. We'll see how that goes, and I'd need to explore those options a little further. And just before we get underway with the questions. I realized that I didn't introduce myself. Hopefully people who have listened to this show before know who I am, but I'm Reverend Jake Zabel of the St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church located in Dolby, Queensland, Australia, which is a member congregation of the Confessional Orthodox Evangelical Lutheran Communion. Now, with the show, if you'd like to have any of your questions answered by future panels, you can email them to nightgeorge at outlook.com dot au or you can send your questions to us via facebook augsburg panel is a show produced by the order of night george 
And if you'd like to look up any of the other stuff produced by the Order of Night George, you can head over to our website, www.nightgeorge.info, or you can just search us on iTunes, SoundCloud, or YouTube. We've got content on all three of those. So, with that all out of the way, let us begin with our first question, which is, what is the role of entertainment in the Christian life? I'll get Matthew to start with this one. Well... <clears throat> So entertainment, Christians should not be entertained at all. No. Um, <clears throat> entertainment is um, one of those things like uh, drinking or, any, you know, any of the other uh, gifts of God that he has given us that we are not to overindulge in. Uh, that's that's my in initial thought on it. So, you know, uh, my wife and I frequent uh, a theater where they do uh, reprises of old rock and roll bands, and we're entertained by that. We watch movies, we're entertained by that. Our children watch movies, they're enter entertained by that. We listen to music, this sort of thing. Um, but uh, what <clears throat> I think, and I think Caleb would agree with this, that I, I think what Western culture is overcome with is um, the... the the desire to be entertained at all times. Um, and I, I, I think that's a problem. Uh, it, it's, it's an overindulgence. It's yeah, I'd, like, I'd agree uh, with you. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, it's like, it's like alcohol. The, the Lord warns us not to become drunkards with alcohol. Uh, and I think the true, I think, I, I think the same thing is true for Christians that we can, we can, um, enjoy entertainment, um, but we're not to overindulge in it. We're we're not to make our lives about entertainment. We make we're to, we're to make our lives about uh, the cause of Christ, the gospel, and, and these sorts of things, and um, and that should be our central focus. Uh, but yeah, I, I, even God, our Father, rested. Um, now, can we call that entertainment? Mm, I don't know. That might be a stretch, but at the, but at the same time, I think entertainment is a rest or a respite from um, uh, from the work that that God has has uh, charged us to do here on the uh, on this planet. So, um, yeah. So, so I, I, I would put entertainment in that category of things like uh, the, the, that the Lord has given us, like like alcohol, um, like, you know, any, you know, any other, uh, thing that might, somebody might call a vice. Um, that's, that's the thing is we, we, we cannot be viced by entertainment. So if we, if we become addicted to it, then that's, that's certainly not Christians. Um, and, and that's, that's what we've, what we've got to be cautious of, especially in the Western world, because, that you know, that's that's the kind of culture that I'm convinced we live in is an entertainment culture um, that we uh, are are constantly in. Uh, you know, here in the West has become theater, and so we we've got to be care we've got we've got to be extremely careful about that. Um, but uh, but we cannot exclude it from the Christian life. Um, yeah, that's it's, it's got to be pursued in measure. Yeah, I think um, Matthew has an excellent point that you know entertainment seems to be one of those things which uh, we are constantly surrounded by. It's one of those things which is a good gift of God, and then one of those things which can also be overused. I mean, um, you know, I, I would add, I think, you know, the economic progress which you know Matthew was talking about in the West has given us a society which has an abundance of entertainment. Um, and we we all have opportunities to do that to to engage in that, and so you do have one of these challenges where it can be abused. But I think Christians too, that you know, the world is sort of opened back up to us, as Oswald Byers said. And you know, entertainment can be also can be viewed not just as a good thing in like the secular way, where we have truly good things from it, like like um, you know, there's some companionship with it you can engage with other people in this there's community that goes around with it matthew said he likes to go these shows with his wife you know there's there's some opportunity there for them to 
enjoy those moments together, to relate to one another. So entertainment can be a valuable tool in that respect. Um, but to the Christian and the non-Christian alike, too, there's, there's a danger in letting leisure rule your life. You can have these things control you. Um, and I think we, as Christians, have the ability to say, you know, using the first commandment, these, this thing can become your God. You can, you can make a God out of entertainment where it captures your life, where you worship it, where that rest which it gives you, you are now seeking as sort of your final rest in place of Christ and Christ crucified. And so, you know, when we get into places like that, Christians are particularly equipped to proclaim that and also to proclaim Christ in place of, um, in place of that. So where people escape or use entertainment as escapism or something like that, we, um, we have actually the final solution to that issue, to that longing, to um, whatever it is people are running from, which is some sort of uh, recognition of the effects of sin, which we can actually put a name to um, with the Word of God, and then we can uh, redeem and forgive, too. So I think it's an important tool like that. Um, you know, some of the other work I've done has been using things which might be called entertainment in a catech catechetical manner. Uh, how Christians can use literature positively, not just as entertainment, but as a, as a teaching tool and things like that to help craft the imaginations of children and adults alike towards certain theological topics. So there's a lot to explore there. But yeah, I think as an issue, and probably, and you know, I don't want to try to read your mind, but probably one of the reasons it comes up is because it does seem like we are part of a culture that is obsessed with entertaining and entertainment. Um, and there definitely is a right and a wrong way to approach this. Um, but Christians also, as we recognize there's a wrong way to approach this, uh, can come in with with Christ as as the answer, um, and perhaps you know, perhaps lead with that as well. Cool. Uh, we'll move on to the next question, number two. Can one be both a Lutheran and a Pentecostal? And we'll get Caleb then to start with this one. Yeah, I thought about this one when you sent it over, and you know, my my first reaction is obviously no. These are two separate confessions of faith um, that have some you know very um, different conclusions during things, particularly concerning like revelation and things like that. Um, Pentecostalism, uh, sort of uh, as a tradition, assails assurance. It causes people to look inside of themselves for the signs of faith or for truth. You know, a word like true faith or the presence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's pretty antithetical to the, the the doneness of baptism, proclamation, the Lord's Supper, those means of grace which deliver uh, the gifts of God to you, which is presented in Lutheran theology. Um, you know, but uh, so as a so as a theoretical in that sense, I think no. One of the things I'd be open to is perhaps there's a person confused out there who calls themselves a Pentecostal, but and a Lutheran who thinks they're sort of towing this line there. Um, I'd have some questions. I'd be curious what do doctrines you're taking or leaving from either side. I think if we describe somebody who say who's like a, a little who's more emotive in worship or something like that as Pentecostal, um, you know, there's certainly probably some room for that. Again, there would be some questions about why or how or are you trying to you know conjure the Holy Spirit or something like this, um, but. I, I think that would be the, the hard question for me is like as a theoretical as doctrines, right? As, as confessions of faith, they are two different confessions of faith that I, I think on the surface are in, and deeper are exclusive. Um, but I do also think there are people who probably have said, well, I'm a Pentecostal Lutheran or something. And they, they probably mean they're more emotive or something like that, but there might be, even then there might be some problems to push back on. Um, so, but I, yeah, that's about it. Uh, Matthew, any further comments? Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, I would say we Lutherans are the original Pentecostals, in the in the in the truest sense of it. I mean, I mean, we celebrate this feast. We we celebrate the feast of Pentecost, the 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 pouring out of the Holy Spirit that the prophet Joel promised, and, um. So I, you know, I, I I've been a part of uh, some very emotional worship settings. Obviously, you know, I was I was a mega church pastor. That was that that was that's that's what I did. That's that's what I tried to um, do each Sunday was was bring this emotional 
uh, quote Pentecostal setting to uh, to worship, and I, you know, just just to be completely frank, the the Lutheran liturgy um, has been something for my part that is uh, that has been. Uh, the most deeply emotional experience I've ever had. So, um, so just, you know, um, when, when I, when I first experienced, uh, the divine service in, in all its fullness and we, and we sang the egg, the Agnes day when, uh, the elements were consecrated, um, that was very emotional. It continues to be very emotional uh, for me. Um, my, uh, and, I, and I've still got uh, evangelical friends who have those type of leanings, those type of very, um, you know, hand-raising, emotional type of worship experiences. And what, what I talk to them about is, hey, we, we do the same thing. We, we raise our hands. We bow. We have physical motions in our divine service that we all do together that are prescribed. Uh, and even though they're, they're prescribed, they, you know, they, they bring forth, I think, what uh, the Pentecostals are after. Now, Maybe even, when you, when you, in fact, because they are prescribed. Because, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly right. And so, um, so what, what what I found uh, astounding about all of this is that you know we we you know we are Pentecostals in the truest sense of the biblical meaning of that, um, especially during certain portions of the year. Um, now, of course, you know when you say Pentecostal, you're you're talking about um, you know, charismatic Christianity, where, um, where, where the glossa is is uh, is evidenced, where there are signs and and wonders and the and these sorts of things. Rejection of, course, of like bapt infant baptism, two baptisms, baptism right. of the Holy Spirit, baptism of water, those right. kinds of things. Right. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the the sacraments are confused and that sort of thing. Um, what what I really think Pentecostals are seeking is is Lutheran liturgy. At, and no question about it, um, they are seeking an experience, and uh, and and okay, you know, I I don't think, in my estimation, but I think even empirically, um, what they are seeking is Lutheran liturgy. What they're seeking is 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 the the historical um, lectionary. What they are seeking is the Lord's body and blood. What they are seeking is is true baptism. Well, they're seeking. And, uh, you know, the interesting yeah. thing is they're seeking. You know, like the the emotive um, element uh, in formal Pentecostalism is an attempt to hear the voice of of God and the Holy Spirit. And right. you know that what the Lutheran you know, order of worship offers is God's voice declared over you time and time again. In confession and absolution, you are yep. absolved. You receive Christ present in the supper. Um, you are given the Holy Spirit and all the gifts of faith in baptism. This is where God comes to speak to you, uh, is, is in worship. Um, you know, it's not us towards him. He actually comes down and does this. And so I think it's it's removing that means which God has told us where he will come to us in the scripture, which is through a preacher who will come and proclaim that word to us, come and give us God's word so that we do hear his voice. Right, right. Well, and it's it, and, and that's a, that's the disconnect between um, what we know as Pentecostalism in the West and 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 the Lutheran faith is. You know, it, it, it just breaks my heart, you know, with with my Pentecostal friends or, or, or my friends who are who are s seeking that that emotive experience um, 
to to say that you know what that's that's such a labor it's 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 such a law um that you that you have to show up and be in and, and present yourself in a state where mm-hmm. you can experience that whereas uh, the lutheran liturgy lutheran um theology says you know what you can show up and not feel it at all mm-hmm. not feel it at all and yet what you are seeking is there it is still there and there's um, nothing you can do to get that more or less right it's exactly. you don't show up to you don't show up to the service and sometimes receive that voice and other times right. not receive that voice right. um it is right. present in that proclaimed word it is present in that absolution it is present in those means this reminds me of a, a article i wrote that was called i i think um enthusiasm in the enthusiasts which talked about the reformation enthusiasts which you know we could call akin to pentecostals today and and sort of the final conclusion there was the enthusiast proper like in all these doctrines is not the one who you know tears up during absolution who lifts a hand in prayer who right. makes the sign of the cross who does actions in worship who you know um who feels something it, it is actually it's the, it's a different thing um it's something which seeks god outside of his means it's something which tries to skirt around where the word promises to be and you know that's a, it's a different it's a different animal entirely and i think you know what i see matthew getting at here is that lutherans are in a unique position to offer this you know this concreteness of where god's word is to meet all these people we know and who we see longing to hear god's voice and to finally proclaim it to them to pro- finally give them his final word to them yeah 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 100 percent. i mean what 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 pentecostal seek we as lutherans offer so can you be a modern day pentecostal and a lutheran no absolutely not uh but what they seek um the lutheran faith offers and and you know and i think caleb and i are in 100 percent agreement on that um what what they're looking for is god's voice they want to hear god's voice um they want they want God's glory shown to them. They they want to see Jesus, and and that's a thing. Um, that that still. I mean, again, I'm I'm a fairly new Lutheran, you know, going on you know six or seven years in this, but um, but when um, but when when my pastor lifts God, Jesus's body, when he lifts Jesus's blood, it's like there's. I am beholding my Lord um, right there in the sacrament. Um, when, when the pastor speaks, I'm listening, you know, uh, you know, my, my son tends to fall asleep in divine services and, and I just give him the elbow and like, Isaac, wake up. The Lord Jesus is speaking to you right now. You know? So, so what, what Pentecostals see we have, um, so can you be a Lutheran and a Pentecostal in, 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 in the modern iterations that no, but what Pentecostals seek we have in reality. Yeah. I think the problem with that is that they're looking in the wrong place. We've got the, we've got the voice of God and the presence of God given to us in word and sacrament and they want to look for it in their emotions generally. Too, too bad we didn't have. Too bad we didn't have Eric with us because Eric's background is in the NAR or New Apostolic Renewal before he came to Lutheranism, so he would have had a field day with um, this question. But we'll move on to the next question, which is, can we use contemporary music in the divine service? Um, Matthew, we'll start with you. Uh, you can if you want to. If if you want to destroy the divine service um i i i have yet to see any contemporary um music settings lyrics you know and and i know there are there are some who are trying to put forth some more um some more hymnody in this sense but i yeah, 
you're just not going to beat um, the hymns that are assigned for the day, uh, the music settings that are that are that have been assigned to those. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah. So, so I'm I'm completely up for contemp quote contemporary music usurping uh, the historical church's uh, use of historic uh, music and their settings, but I just haven't seen it yet. So, so a- as of yet, um, I would say, yeah. There's just there's just not a place for it. Uh, the the hymns assigned for the day, uh, the settings assigned for the day, um, in the instrumentation that has been our tradition. Uh, you're yeah you yeah you if you can beat that, then I might raise an eyebrow to it. But so far, I haven't seen that. And you talk about entertainment. Um, that is really what we're talking about here. Are, are, are we trying to? So, so what's so what's the point of contemporary worship? The point of contemporary worship is to entertain, first and foremost. If we can, the the idea is if we can entertain, then we can present the gospel to these people. And I think that it has the notion of worship. Flipped on its head, Caleb. Uh, this will. I have a, a slight disagreement um, with this. Uh, full disclosure: my whole life, I've gone to a traditional liturgical service. I I don't just feel forced to it. I enjoy organ music. I enjoy classical hymnody. I was, in fact, known to be the student who, every once in a while, got in trouble for um, abstinently standing outside the doors of a chapel while contemporary services were going on inside. Um, at the same time. I think if we're asking the question, as was posed on, uh, as you said, it just contemporary music, I think um, while it might not be my aesthetic preference, that music could take place of music in, in worship. So where hymns are assigned, one could put contemporary music. I don't think that's always pulled off very well. I think sometimes uh, that the music is not written nearly as well or as theologically impactful um, but nonetheless, I think it could be there. I think it's different when it's, um, you know, as Matthew said, our tra- it's not organically part of our tradition like it is for some evangelical churches to use contemporary music. We've been using rough, you know, the same hymnody with added hymns for a long time. We we can proudly say we've been singing the same songs as other people for you know hundreds of years. We can we can chase that back, and there's something there's a there's a pride to that that I can be connected to to people who have believed the same things as me and confessed the same things as me throughout history. Um, and we've, and we've worshiped in this way too. Um, but I think there is a way for contemporary music to be used in a service that it doesn't usurp. I've, you know, likewise from the entertainment argument I have watched, um, I'm not saying this is universal, but I have watched liturgical worship become, um, self-centered and entertainment too, in certain circumstances. Uh, you know, I've gone to, you know, concerts that are hymnody. So it's, you know, and I wouldn't have called that worship because there wasn't the key pieces of worship there, like confession, absolution, and preaching, proclamation, the Lord's Supper. So, so I think those are two different questions, like a contemporary worship, which replaces those things, gets rid of those things, really is a concert, is problematic. A form of worship, which um, changes the music, um, could be problematic in certain settings, right? Like, I wouldn't want to go do that to um, churches just all across and say, this is what you're moving to now, right? You don't change what people have have done on them. But, you know, there could, I have witnessed organic groups of Lutherans who came out of evangelical circles, came and embraced the liturgy, liturgical worship, loved it, but also wanted to incorporate some other music that they enjoyed. And I've, I've sat in on those services. And again, while it's not always uh, my aesthetic preference, I've, I have witnessed it done in a respectful way, which integrates with the liturgy and doesn't usurp it. Um, do I think that's universal? No. Do I think it's been pulled off very badly in some Lutheran churches? Absolutely. So it, I think it's a, it's a complex question, but just on as a principle, yes, we can change the music. Um, worship is not about the music. It accents 
uh, why we are worshiping. Uh, yeah. So, so, right. So, well, uh, so, so my, my question to Caleb there would be, um, I, I, I don't think there is anything in contemporary worship that rivals 16th, 17th century hymnody. Yeah. I mean, Uh, I think, and, 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 and instrumentation. Yeah. But I think that's like preference and that's a, Maybe even like you have an appreciation for musicality that certain people don't. There, we have to acknowledge that there are certain things in modern music which are appealing, like certain beats. Some people, you know, have been around guitars or drums. That's a that's a form of music that is less alien to them. Um, you know, I know you came out of a background that wasn't liturgical, so like this is you know you're definitely an argument for somebody who can fully embrace that and still enjoy that. Um, you know, and again, I hate. Uh, I hate centering the worship wars on the music. Like, you know, the LCMS went through a period of sort of like these church growth worship wars for a while. It was before my time, but I was aware with it because it was while my dad was um, in college. And so it was a, you know, a thing that was still talked about. You know, and one of the things that I've learned in reflecting on this is too much of the conversation was about the music and not about what else was getting removed in the service. And some of that was directly associated with music, which was actually associated with a growth mentality that was willing to abandon everything. Um, and it could have been any style of worship, but it was able, it was willing to abandon core elements for growth. I just don't think that's a universal. And while like, like you, Matthew, I definitely prefer classical hymnody and I think it's strong. I've also seen like some things that we could call contemporary music, which are uh, um, adapted hymns, which I've I've seen done extraordinarily well. I've I have been part of a you know in service with an adapted um, mighty fortress, which blew me away at how good it was. So I mean, it's just it's circumstantial. I think when it comes to the style of the music, right? Well, so so we again you know, we can we can debate instrumentation, but I guess I, the thing of it is. Um, I have yet to see, I mean, uh, I mean, maybe um, it's possible because Lutherans haven't really been engaging in it. Right. So like it, we could yeah. say like, it's not been beat, but a lot of those hymns were written by, uh, Lutherans, you know, even we, we Bach is on our side, right? Like we have amazing sure. musicians in those more classical eras. It, uh, we haven't had really good Lutheran expo. Like what I would agree with you on is we haven't really had good Lutheran exploration of music in this modern time, um, at least in worship. So, you know, a lot of times we're just bringing in evangelical songs that have a lot of evangelical theological baggage. Like, I agree. I totally agree with that. Like, I think there is a right and a wrong way to do it. And I've been witness to both ways, but I've also seen people make a conscious effort to say, like, use only adapted hymns, for instance. So the, like the, the lyrics are theologically sound. They are theologically Lutheran. Um, and the music was still still good, so and you know maybe not even every Sunday. I've I've been to a church that did it like you know once once every four weeks or something, and they replaced two of the hymns with with this group who was actually very musically talented and things like that. It wasn't hokey, um, you know. I just I don't want to give the firm no because I think sort of like ontologically it's possible, even though I totally agree. Like in most circumstances where I've seen it done, it's not done. It's not done well. Yeah, well, yeah, that's 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 the thing that um, that that I've observed is that you know so so I go to Redeemer Lutheran Church, Fort Wayne, Indiana, right? So we you know what what we do is very it's about um, as high a liturgy as you can get in the LCMS. Indeed, and so um, so what so what my question has been. Um, instead of bringing in um, guitars, drums, or alter, you know, altering something like a mighty fortress um, instrumentally uh, to contemporary uh, desires, is hey, what, what, why don't you call the local uh, community college or the local college and and ask them, hey, do you have a chamber? Uh, or, or do you have a, a stringed orchestra that can play this instead of a rock band? Um, you know, uh, uh, 
yeah, they, uh, you know, I, I, I think we can make that, you know, we, we can have that debate about what is more reverent. Um, because, because I've, I've played, you know, I've been in worship bands that have played a mighty fortress that are, you know, you know, rock and roll jazz stuff that, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so I think there's a, I mean, I think there's a motivational question to ask, right. Um, like my final point would be, is that, um, you know, as much as we enjoy the, in in music certainly helps with worship. It helps order the flow, helps focus, refocus us on certain things. It is not, it is not what we gather around. We could in fact do liturgies without worship or without music, not without worship, (laughs) but we could do them without mute. We could do them without music. Um, and that, you know, that wouldn't be a sin and we wouldn't be missing God's word there. And so, you know, I, I think there are lots of questions about motivation, style, which one's better. Um, I do think some of those come down to preference. Like personally though, I do, I do think some of those come down to preference or even community or that particular church and, um, and what they decide to do as, as a community. I think, you know, there is something wrong about forcing um, contemporary worship on churches that have been doing, uh, you know, listening and playing the same hymns for a hundred years and just sort of pushing it on them from the outside. I think there's something actually sort of atrocious about that. I think also if you had a church start up and organically the music was more contemporary and they're still using the liturgy, I don't think it would necessarily be fair to make them ha- hire an organist if one wasn't available. I've actually, in the last two years, I have frequently gone to two churches which do not have organists and cannot find organists. I live in a small town in Big Bear um, in California. It's in the mountains, and there's a small Lutheran church here. And they play all of their hymns off of a CD because there's they have no organist. And so the CD is okay. Um, there's a lot of gaps. There's a lot of misplays and things like that. Honestly, I would rather take those hymns played on a six-string guitar than the, how bad the CD is sometimes. And so it's, you know, I, I think there's some, there's some give and take there. Yeah. Well, um, what's, uh, what's, what's 1517's approach to these sorts of things? I mean, you guys do a lot of the big conferences and that sort of thing. Yeah. How do you guys, yeah. What, what, what do you guys do at 1517? Yeah. The conference, you know, we, um, we have music. We don't call it worship because we don't, there's no preaching. There's no confession, and absolution. There's no Lord's supper to it. Um, but there's music breaks in between the things. Um, so, uh, we, but it's contemporary. It's contemporary for our style of conference. It is a lot, largely adapted hymns. Um, there, somebody, Blake Flatley runs an organization. that's an RSO of the LCMS called communion arts, which offers, uh, updated, like, well, updated is not the right word, but, uh, instrumentation for guitars and other things for hymns. Um, and he, he leads, those we also host a classical organ concert um at a nearby church i'm forgetting the name of the church which is sad because it's one of my favorite in san diego uh, pastor brian thomas I know somebody might be able to find it somewhere but yeah we host an organ concert there as well but yeah the music during the conference is um contemporary but i you know, the funny thing about that though is everybody at 1517 goes to a non-contemporary lutheran church so it's sort of a stylistic decision yeah, well, um, so what's what's behind the idea of <clears throat> of of instead of trying to draw people into the 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 traditional music? Um, well, it's not about like, not drawing them. It's like we're not a church. Fifteen seventeen is not a church. It's a think tank, so we don't host a church service during there. So, like, if we were hosting a church service, it would be a different conversation. Um, we also have believers from all sorts of different backgrounds there we have lots of calvinists who show up at the conference and things like that so we don't host like worship um so in the sense that we don't we don't do a liturgical service and so that's part of it and like i said we do a classical organ concert that's hymnody too during the thing so it's not like it's trying to turn people one direction or the other um it's it's just been a, a choice and i'm not part of planning the conferences but i'll say it is enjoyable i have enjoyed that music there there's a level of it where it is entertainment because it's a break and things like that between speaking so the conference is laid out differently than say your your typical lutheran uh, conference it's not sort of academic papers given but 
we have speakers breakouts over multiple days. And so the, mu- the music breaks up and, and orders that for the day. Yeah. I, I, okay. I mean, I, it just seems to me like that, you know, um, if 15, 17 is, you might draw people back in, you know, back into this, these more traditional forms of worship um, rather than, uh, you know, and really focus on that. We should probably get back on track. Yeah, uh, just I was just going to, before we get on to the next question, was just on this topic, you the comment you made, Matt, about like entertainment and and the fact of there not being kind of, a, as you feel, a type of contemporary worship that can like outdo the traditional worship. I, I was just reminded by an old quote from uh, Table Talk Radio, which I, I've got it because I made a meme version of it, so I've got it on my computer. It's a, Evan and Brian were talking about the concept of contemporary worship, and Evan made this uh, great quote, which is, the question should not be, will it win more people over? The question should be, does this deliver Christ in a better way than it already does? And the parts of the liturgy are direct quotes from Holy Scripture, and I don't think you can improve upon the delivery of Christ from them. And I'll leave it with that, and we'll move on to question four, which is, is communism compatible with Christianity? And so I think it was Caleb's turn to start. Ah. (laughs) This was an interesting one. Um, My answer is sort of similar to the Pentecostalism one. I think... There are plenty of examples. I mean, there's plenty about communism, which is against Christianity. Many famous atheists and political leaders who were communists who used it sort of as a a charge against religion. So in that respect, I think it would be difficult to say the least. Um, I also believe that I have, you know, maybe not personally met, but I've seen people who might call themselves a communist and call themselves a Christian. I certainly have questions. I, um, <laughs> at the very least, I have, I certainly have questions because I think there's lots of contradictory things in the communist worldview to the declarations of, of Christianity. So, um, so if somebody is describing themselves as both, like I said, I, I have questions about how they're navigating that, um, but I would be afraid to say, no, you're not a Christian if you think you're a communist. Um, maybe it's the other way around. Maybe this person is actually a Christian um, and thinks they're a communist for one reason or another. I actually think that that's probably pretty common nowadays with sort of the rise of um, socialist politic uh, is just that people assume things like, you know, wanting increased social services of some sort. Um they, that person might describe themselves as a communist without actually like adhering to some sort of communist doctrine concerning the world. Um, but yeah, I think it has like in history served as a counter religion and a confession of faith that is against the Christian confession. So in that sense, no, in the sense that people um, say and do all sorts of contradictory things with what they actually believe um, Probably, maybe there are people who describe themselves as both out there. But and again, if I if I came across one of those people, I would have some serious questions and I'd and an interesting conversation. Yeah, well, um, th- this gets really complicated because, um, of course, uh, you know the seventh commandment dictate dictates to us that private poverty is a thing. Um, and and so therefore, uh, at, at, you know, as as we see in the Jewish theocracy, which is, um, pr- you know, uh, the, the aspects of that promulgated by Saint Paul in the New Testament, um, this notion of of the government being the ones who uh, take care of the oppressed and downtrodden. That that is the job of the church, and and any time we find the church bearing the sword, we have major problems. I mean, that's that we can we can we can uh, look at that 
from Constantine through the Middle Ages is the church began to bear the sword. And that's a major problem. Yeah, to, to be a political agent in the world to bring about, you know, some sort of rule or order or righteousness in this world is sort of against its calling. Yep, exactly right. Um, and when, uh, when, when, the, when the government is called to preach and that encompasses the idea of, um, of caring for, uh, the sojourner, the, the, the fatherless, the widows, the oppressed, um, when we bring the government in to, uh, serve as a proxy for that. Um, we histor- uh, history has shown us that millions of people die when uh, the government takes on that role. And so, um, so this is something that I'm um, very passionate about. You know, this this idea that the the government bears the sword. And the church preaches, which yeah, and and I would say uh, that the that the role of the church is to look after the 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 widow, the orphan, the father. You know, that's that's our job. Um, it's not the job of the government to come in and say we're we're going to take on this role, which is what communism essentially does. Now, um, in our day and time. Uh, communism, Marxism, socialism has taken on some uh, veiled roles. Yeah, um, you, you really have to define it with whoever you're having the conversation with because, you know, there, yeah. there are people who, like, you'll call a communist because they hold certain political positions and they'll very sort of aggressively say, no, I'm, I'm not a communist. There are other people, you know, I've, run, I've run into young people who call themselves a socialist or call themselves a communist who like if you really push them on it they're not actually a communist um they just sort of you know want these certain these political programs yes right and those kinds of things well you know there might be you know communists might advocate for something like that but advocating for even if i disagree with it as a political um stance medicare for all is not necessarily communist or something like that well right well it's certainly socialist um i mean you know if 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 we did the medicare for all thing you know Mm -hmm. we we would you know we would be invoking a socialist uh policy you know you know under a capitalistic system but 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 that's not my my major concern my my major concern is is how postmodernism has has influenced western culture um and, and and has try and has attempted to turn, um, you know, natural law and biblical law on its head in order to accomplish uh, a political purpose. So to say that sympathy toward those who who struggle with uh, gender dysphoria um, is 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 a topic that um, that that the church. Should, should embrace and in some way figure out how to affirm these people um, it is at its root um, a neo-marxist movement because you know you, you know this idea of oh well you know let's let homosexual couples um, have the privilege of mar- of marriage uh, because what you know, who is ultimately harming? And so, so this this postmodernist worldview has kind of has has, has kind of well, yeah. There's yeah. a there's but, a ten- but, yeah there's a tendency for the church to uh, I, I don't want to say the church, but for churches or or individuals within the church to adopt political positions, sort of as we were talking before, as sort of this growth thing, right? So finding a way to accept or adopt certain political positions, whether those be from the radical left or, or left we move in, or even more conservative political policies become sort of what you're preaching from the pulpit. Um, and so, yeah, I, I do I, I do think there's a tendency to do this. And you could definitely see a tendency to do that with, say, communist policy, like 
like this question talks about, right, where Christians sort of try to contort the faith or, or our doctrine to incorporate uh, communism um, as like a as a political and as a worldview principle and as something the church can accomplish and things like that. I've seen very di- various different flavors of this, and that seems pro- that seems problematic. On well, it doesn't seem problematic. That is problematic on many different levels, primarily because it it undermines uh, the gospel. It undermines the proclamation of the law and the gospel, and it starts proclaiming something else, um, something about gain in this world. And you know, the the second part, the second thing I would have with this question is being careful to not to um, start using a question like this to determine who the promises of God applies to or doesn't apply to. So, for instance, does the promise do the promises of God apply to the communist? The answer is, of course, yes. Will that faith or should that faith um, produce some change or is there going to be some contradiction there if a communist all of a sudden declares, I believe in Christ Jesus alone is my salvation? Absolutely. And that's a, that's the, you know, this sort of this further up, further in language as C.S. Lewis uses or as, um, you know, Lutherans have used, we can catechize people further into the faith after those promises of God have been delivered over to them. I just wanted to finish up that section with an um, interesting Sasa quote that I remember on, I was reading through Sasa on the topic of communism, and he addressed the question that always comes up when people say, who want to promote communism as part of Christianity, they say, well, what about in Acts when it said they had all things in common? And he goes into the fact that, well, this is the church, this is people doing it voluntarily, this is people donating things, and he comes up with the great line where he says, communism says, what is thine is now mine, whereas Christianity says, what is mine is now thine. Yeah, I think that's, you know, there's, there is a tendency, uh, I'm kind of glad that you brought that up, there's a tendency for sort of the early church communalism to be sort of like an advocation for Christians to endorse communism as a political ends and uh that's also quote is great because it really is it's an advocating um like matthew said of the use of the sword against the populace in order to um coerce them into what some are reading as a christian ethic of communalism and and that that is against the gospel that is against the declarations of christ okay so our next question is uh, is the Pope the Antichrist? Um, can't remember who turn it is. Uh, either way, whoever wants to jump in, you can answer first. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah, he's 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 an anti. <laughs> well, in the yeah. modern iteration, for sure. <laughs> well, and I think I, I stand with Luther that the office is, is to fundamentally stands in in place of Christ and affects people's conscience and reception of the gifts of Christ. Um, it sort of does one of the things like the Pentecostal does. It looks for the voice of God outside of scripture um, yep. and outside of where he's promised to be. And so it's in it, it asks people to seek that, you know, there's a video circulating about two weeks ago where Pope Francis smacked a woman's hand away who was grabbing her. And a lot of people were really, really offended that the Pope, might get physical uh, with somebody. And one of the things I thought it was a good reminder of was, one, he's still human, and people don't like getting pulled on. Um, and two, a woman desperately needed to touch him because there was something holy about him, and that's where she could get some holiness or some contact with God's grace. And that's, that's fundamentally him and that office standing in the place of Christ. Um, she does not need to touch him to receive God's grace. Um, she receives it through, through the proclaimed word, through the sacrament, through through means which God has given her constant access to. Not just that one time the Pope is running by. Yeah, well, and and you know the the, the other way I, I would say that the, the papacy is is antichrist is that. Um, we we have received tradition from what we might term as the Romanist Church, uh, you know, men like Thomas Aquinas, um, Augustine, etc., um, that that have 
exposited Holy Scripture, and in particularly in the case of uh, Aquinas with natural law, um, morality, um, and and the papacy, you know, the authority of the papacy has has obscured that, um, and, and even for Lutherans in a lot of ways, because you know, um, you know, I've heard some say that well, Aqu- you know, Aquinas was. Um, under the under the authority of the papacy, so therefore he's illegitimate, or you know um, yeah, these sorts of things. Yeah, that's a uh, pretty so, that's a pretty bad critique of Aquinas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, right. So, so yeah, so I you know I think I I I I think we as Lutherans can in, in a lot of ways lay quite lay claim to Aquinas. You know, in 90% of what he said and wrote, Um, I don't think we as Lutherans should be ashamed in a lot of ways to call ourselves Thomists um, in in apologetics, uh, in ethics and and these sorts of things, Um, you know, but but uh, that the this stigma, rightly so, of that office of you know, and I agree. And again, I agree with Caleb of Antichrist um, ha- has caused major problems. So, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's uh, some every once in a while, there's something like, well, somebody will say, you know, you've lost your connection to the one true church or something like that. Um, that has to do with transmission and the sort of this question of apostolic authority which is also related to to the pope and where he receives his authority and how, how he receives his call and the, these things it, it just it muddles it muddles how christ is truly um transmitted to to believers through through hearing and and yeah. how that's not it's not a pol- you know a political organization on this earth which holds the only keys to that. It's actually the word which holds the keys to that. And, and, and Lutherans can thus lay claim to the entirety of um, the history of the church, really pre-Reformation, because, you know, this is, the Reformation was a recovery of, of doctrines. It wasn't an invention of doctrines. It wasn't a, it wasn't a throwing um, off of the church to start a new church. It was, um, it was saying, there is an error which is no longer, um, you know, the law and the gospel is distinguished, and the proclamation of the gospel has been usurped by these other things. And one of those was identified was the office of the papacy, and you know, I that remains true to this day. Yeah, well, and and, and here, here's the, here's the thing that I would call most antichrist about the about the quote unquote office of the papacy is that God intended. For Jake, you, Caleb, you, me, Matt, to hear God's voice directly from Holy Scripture. He intended that. And the office of the papacy usurps that. To say that, no, 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 you can't understand God's voice unless I interpret it to you. And um, that that is what I think is most antichrist about the papacy. Is that um, is that we have? I mean, our our even even our copies of Holy Scripture contain God's voice, and we can hear that, we can understand that, and I think that's what God meant that we as individuals could receive that, understand it without it being interpreted by some magisterium uh, that 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 had to come along and tell us what it meant. No, we just we do need it delivered, right? So we need we need it delivered from the outside, and the and the papacy sort of confused right. that delivery with right. who owns it. I was gonna say it reminds me of the Luther quote where he says, "The simplest layman armed with the word of God is more powerful than the mightiest pope." Yeah, yeah, yep, absolutely. That's right. That's right. Before yeah. we get on to our last question, I'd just then like to recommend to people to go look at our bike. I don't know where it is. I might even go ahead and pop a link to it in the description if I can find where it is again. But Brian Wolfmuller put together this um, um, word, uh, like a PDF document of just different quotes from Catholic doctrines of what the Pope says concerning about the office of the Pope. Basically, it's just a list of quotes to say the Pope 
is the Antichrist because he's put himself in the position of basically God over the church. And he just basically, from the Catholic Catechism, here's Vatican I, here's Council of Florence, the 1000s and all this stuff where the Pope says he's the infallible head of the church. And So our last question is, before we get to our um, wrap-up question that I use for each show, is, is smoking sinful? And again, just jump in, whoever wants to answer first. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, I, I would. I mean, you, yeah, well, uh, so go ahead, go ahead, Caleb. Yeah, I mean, I, I would simply say no. I think Matthew and I, um, you know, what, while we were sitting here, um, both agreed and sort of we're, we're talking about how much we both uh, enjoy the, you know, some casual smoke. Some, um, I, I enjoy pipe smoking, uh, the very rare cigar but i i do like them and things like that and um i think it's related to like that first question that first question was about the role of entertainment right and and matthew brought up things that can go wrong when overused um smoking probably well smoking falls into that category yeah yeah that yeah that's absolutely absolutely right yeah i mean you know um god gave us wine to make glad the hearts of men uh but when overindulged um, it becomes sinful. I mean, Holy Scripture is clear on this. I, you know, I, and, and same thing with you know entertainment, smoking, um, any in, any of these things that that the Lord has given us as gifts. When when abuse, sex, you know, for example, you know when when you know when those when that when when those are abused, um, then that's when they become sinful. Um, yeah, they become so first commandment issues right yeah. like yeah. it can become something you're dependent on it can be that thing you trust in your god you can see you know yeah. y- you we've probably all known people uh, been close to people who are sort of dependent on that next cigarette um and it's that dependence that trust that does that you can see things too where you can take like a vocational aspect to this you can see smoking or drinking or any of these affect somebody's work affect somebody's family life this could get in the way of your relationship with your kids or the way that your kids perceive the things you believe or teach, which comes down to the faith. There's all sorts of issues that can trickle down to this, which aren't inherent to smoking only, um, but sort of are just the product of sinfulness in our lives. And we can see that worked out in all sorts of, of good things. Yeah. So, so, um, you know, if you're a smoker, I mean, you, you enjoy smoking cigarettes, you know, I, I would just say, you know, uh, reflect on that. Reflect on it. Um, and and if it's you know just like Caleb said, if it's it's if it's become your god, that's a problem. That's a major problem. Yeah, and I think you know that's uh, that can be a little hyperbolic, but in because people are like, well, I don't worship them, right? I'm not. I don't pray cigarettes. You know, Luther Luther does a pretty excellent job in in the large catechism and in the small called articles explaining, you know, ex- exactly. Um, how often we let other things become our God. You know, how many idols we can indeed and do indeed craft for ourselves. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, and, uh, and, and, and I think through this podcast, we've been talking a lot of law. You know, and, and, and um, we as Christians, uh, baptized and, and redeemed by Christ, are called to obey the commands of Holy Scripture but at the same time, I think it's important that we that we remember if we're struggling with something like addiction, that the answer is not do more and try harder. Mm-hmm. The answer is um, the Lord's forgiveness. It's it's grace. We we we've got to go to our pastors and and confess to them in private confession and absolution. We you know we we've got to admit these things. Um, well, because, absolutely. I mean, look how much the yeah. world ber- berates smokers. You know, I yep. I can't lately. I can't watch a YouTube video without seeing forty anti tobacco ads in my feed, <laughs> shaming um, people for this. Right. right? The world, oh, the world apart from Christ is nothing but law. It is. It right. is just cr- constantly berating us. Um, the church. As it, as it proclaims, the gospel of Christ is that only refuge. And so, yeah, as Christians, when we know somebody broken by these sins, it is our job to to meet them with Christ, um, too. And, that, you know, this gets to the, back to, like, the communist thing. We have to be careful about saying, who do the promises of Christ apply to? Do I need to make sure that person's not a communist or not a Pentecostal? 
Pentecost or not a smoker before I proclaim Christ to them. No, you need to proclaim Christ to them and, and help them. Then after yeah. that, that's sort of you're calling it right. to your neighbor. Yeah, that, that that's right. And, you know, I think, uh, and, and part of that is procl- proclaiming law to say that, you know, okay, um, you know, what what you are doing is harmful to yourself, and let let me present the solution to you. Um, uh, you know, but 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 at but at the same time, I think, you know, we we as Christians, we we want to obey the commands of Holy Scripture. I mean, that that's that's a thing. You know, uh, you know, I came out of an evangelical background. I became, you know, uh, liberal progressive you know, scumbag. And, and, and in a lot of ways I could still consider myself that. Um, but, but what brought me back to the church was the gospel to say that my, my sins are forgiven. And, and to say that, you know, you don't have to keep being a scumbag. <laughs> um, you, you know, the Lord has freed you from that. And now you can obey the commands of Holy scripture. And that, you know, that gives me great hope. That gives me great hope for, for, for my life on this side of eternity. Um, to say, you know, and, and I think that's what a, what a lot of people are longing for, is, to, is um, they are looking for freedom from um, their bondage to uh, the, the sinfulness of this world. Um, they, w- they want to be better people. I mean, I want, I want to be a better man. And, and, um, the gospel promises that promises us that, um, and yeah. And so, so, so I'm hopeful and, uh, and, and the Lutheran faith has made that more clear to me than, you know, everything else I've tried and believe me, I've tried it all. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, right. So the, the gospel makes promises, whereas, you know, you can, uh, People looking to to get better can. There's a lot of self help out there, more than ever, yep. really. Yeah. Um, yeah. And absolutely. so, in the in the gospel, does the exact om- opposite of um, giving you a list. It it promises you. It promises who you are. It declares you something new. It recreates you. It's it's a word which has actual action. So. Before we get on to our final, final question for the episode, I'd just like to remind everybody that the Order of Night George has our own publishing house, which we just publish books through Lulu, and if you'd like to purchase any books, you can head over to the Order of Night George website, www.nightgeorge.info, and click on the Books tab, and it'll have the full catalogue there. Um, and also, we have every Augsburg panel, we have a Book of the Month, and the Order of Night George Book of the Month now for January 2020 is A Brief History of the Latvian Evangelical Lutheran Church in Adelaide. This was written by Reverend Valdus Anderson of the Lutheran Church of Australia. This was a, originally a paper he presented to the Lutheran Archives on the history of the Latvians in uh, Adelaide, and he gave me permission to publish his book, so it is available from the Order of Night George Publishing House. Just look at, for it on Lulu or go to the Order of Night George and you'll be able to find it there in the book catalogue. But with that done, let's get on to our final, final question. So last year, I was ending every panel with the question, um, highs and lows in the ministry. Uh, this year, I'm going to change it up. So we're going to have a new final question for each year. And our final question for 2020 is, your favorite writing of Martin Luther and why? And also, just say, can you explain a little bit about the document in in your you know what is this document? So we'll get Matthew to start. What is your favorite Luther writing and why? Um, I like Holger Sontag's um, interpretation of uh, the Antinomian Disputations from Luther. Uh, my Again, this is this. You know, um, I'm an amateur, but from the from the, from the outside looking in, I I see a great danger in the LCMS right now uh, with with antinomianism, with with the idea that yes, we have hope in the gospel, um, and and 
don't 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 worry too much about that um, obedience thing. I I am observing a itera- yeah, an iteration. Yeah, again, I just I just don't have enough uh, experience to observe this, but it seems like what what the LCMS is going through right now is is a version of what Luther went to, went through when he wrote the uh, the antinomian dispu- disputations to say that okay um, on the one hand we're dealing with Rome which is um, which which is a doctrine that says we contribute to our justification and Luther spent uh, the first early years of his ministry speaking against that. Uh, but it seems that the pendulum swung very quickly in Lutheran's time to say that, well, uh, uh, since we don't have to work for our justification, then therefore uh, good works, um, holy living, uh, living according to the commands of Holy Scripture really aren't that ver- aren't that very important. And so, um, so Luther uh, penned these uh, antinomian dispensations, which again, um, uh, the, the the best uh, docu- uh, the best uh, resource I could uh, steer you towards is Holger Sontag's um, interpretation of the antinomian dispensations, uh, which uh, which talk about these things, and and, and it kind of seems like we're in that time. You know, with um, with different, uh, pa- you know, very famous pastors. I, you know, one I can think of is Tolian Chavichin, um, which, you know, I admired for a time until I kind of I, I, I kind of caught on to this. Um, you know, to, to, to just say that uh, a, a person should look at these. You know, and and be uh, understanding of the fact that that God calls us to holy living, that he that as Christians we are called to 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 obey the commands of Holy Scripture. So so I like so anyway. Long story short, I like that the antinomian disputations um, is is one that I think is very poignant for our time. And Caleb, your favorite writing of luther and why this might be one of the hardest questions of the night uh for me you know i i i love um the small catechism for its simplicity and the ability to give it to lots of people i i really enjoy the antinomian disputations as matthew pointed out i think they're very timely um for for the sake of this though you know i'm really on the bondage of the will right now i've reread it probably four or five times in recent years and um i think it's a fantastic document it's it's not the easiest one to work through of luther's um writings it's certainly not the first thing i would give a new lutheran but i think it's important because it assails uh how much we try to reintroduce human agency into god's promises and um i think that that sort of transcends time it it gets at our lust to be Become God to sort of you know as as the serpent tempted them that you that you will be like God and to take that one step further and to sort of take the place of God um, in all things including our salvation and you know the bondage of the will sort of um, you know for people who don't know it's a response to Erasmus it deals with you know the philosophical ideas behind free will and and agency towards uh, salvation and it also deals with you know God's declarations and what that does to a person, how one becomes bound to Christ in salvation, and um, and what what the results of that are and look like. And again, I think it's particularly um, important because it it shows us, it demonstrates to us um, how much we try to make God's promises contingent on our doing. Um, we we try to subvert God to be below us while with our lips highlighting him above us. Um, and it's, it's important to be shown uh, when we're being hypocritical, when we're, when we're trying to overpower God. And uh, it's, you know, I think it's actually really poignant against Americans because, you know, freedom is 
so central to us. And so that's, that slips, you know, in utter freedom and agency slips into our theology a lot. And Luther, Luther assails that, um, you know, free will is a fiction, he declares. So it's, you know, I, I love it. I think it's very pointed. Again, it's not what I would start people off on. I love this small catechism for that. I love handing that, um, especially people who aren't Lutheran and, and sort of giving them that gift. But yeah, bunch of the will. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you. And that wraps up this um, panel for the month. So thank you, Matt and Caleb, for coming on. Uh, disappointed we didn't have Eric on, but there's always future panels. So thanks for coming on. I hope you've enjoyed your time, and I hope the listeners have enjoyed listening to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having us. Yep. Thank you. I appreciate your fun. time. Yeah, thanks, Jake. That was fun. <laughs>